My name is Jack Klieger, President and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And I'd like to welcome you to the second session of the 21st annual Banya Gottesfeld Heller Conference for Educators. We're grateful to the family of our museum's dear friend, Banya Gottesfeld Heller, of blessed memory for their ongoing support of Holocaust education at the museum. Banya Heller was a survivor, a philanthropist, and an author who taught countless students and educators during a remarkable life. She was an inspiration. We all learned from Fania's spirited dedication to Holocaust education and Jewish learning. Today's program will focus on the topic of art and legacy, bringing together survivors and their descendants, and on a teacher who strives to bear witness to her work with her students. We dearly miss Fania Heller, and we are honored to remember her with her family. And I'd like to welcome and thank those members of her family in our audience today. At this time, I'd like to invite Elizabeth Edelstein, Vice President for Education, to begin the program. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure and honor to begin today's program. We're so glad you could join us. Every year, the Fania Gottesfeld Heller Award for Excellence in Holocaust Education is awarded to a teacher whose work exemplifies the values that Mrs. Heller lived. We're very pleased this year to present the award to Ms. Rachel Torres. Ms. Rachel Torres is a proud New Yorican from the Bronx who transplanted to Newtown, Connecticut 15 years ago. She teaches ninth grade world history and 12th grade AP psychology at Newtown High School. In addition, she advises the geography team and the school's group called Students Advocating for Diversity and Equity. As a University of Connecticut Dodd E Fellow, Ms. Torres traveled to Lithuania and Poland where she studied pre-war Jewish life. As a summer seminar participant at the Olga Lengel Institute for Holocaust Education and Human Rights, she visited this museum, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and was introduced to our exhibits and ed educational resources. Subsequently, she arranged for her students to meet with a member of the Museum Speakers Bureau, a Holocaust survivor. The dialogue between her Newtown High School students and the survivor was deeply meaningful and Ms. Torres contributed a powerful article about the encounter to the museum's blog. Ms. Torres's commitment to furthering her own and her students' knowledge of Holocaust history and strengthening her students' resolve to take action in the face of injustice gives life to the legacy of Mrs. Fania Gottesfeld Heller. We're very pleased to recognize Ms. Rachel Torres today for excellence in Holocaust education. Um, we were very pleased to be able to deliver the actual award to uh, Rachel ahead of time, something you can't uh, take for granted these days. Um, and I invite her now to address the Heller family and conference attendees. Rachel, give me a moment to spotlight you and I'd love to have you uh, take the mic as soon as I've done that. Thank you, Liz, so much for this honor. Here is my award. Hopefully you can take a really good look at it. Isn't it just beautiful? First, I'd like to thank my beloved husband, John O'Leary, our four beautiful children, uh, Jacqueline, David, Jonathan, and Abigail, my devoted parents, family members, friends, and colleagues. I appreciate your presence here to witness me receive this incredible honor. Uh, your support has made it possible for me to pursue my love of teaching so that I can impact, inspire, and influence the lives of my students in the classroom. Thank you to Jack Klieger, President and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage and the Museum's Board of Trustees for nominating me for this award. A special thank you to Mrs. Heller's family for choosing me to be the recipient of the Fania Gettisfeld Heller Award for Excellence in Holocaust Education in memory of your beloved. I am truly humbled by this honor. Allow me to begin with Feliz Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah in Spanish. 
As a spiritual person, it is not lost on me the significance that I would receive this honor during this Jewish holiday. In this spirit, I dedicate this award to my students who are the direct recipients of my work that I do in the classroom. Every day, I endeavor to cultivate an environment, whether it's in person, hybrid, or remote, that transforms my students into compassionate and informed global citizens for change. And what better way to do this than through teaching about the Holocaust? A critical lesson I want my students to understand is the importance of remembering and honoring the memory of those who have endured unspeakable tragedy. The proliferation of Holocaust denial via social media underscores how imperative it is to never forget. Unfortunately, there have been incidents of anti-Semitism at my high school and even in my classroom where this has occurred. I heard somewhere that anti-Semitism and COVID-19 have a bit in common. Anti-Semitism, just like COVID-19, is a virus, an age-old one, that permeates communities and destroys lives. As we anticipate the arrival of the vaccine for COVID-19 and analyze its efficacy, we need look no further for the vaccine to anti-Semitism. It is Holocaust education. As an educator, it is my duty to administer this vaccine, this form of education to my students. It is the only way students will develop historical empathy and are challenged to reflect on choices they have made in the face of injustice when they saw something and did nothing. Holocaust education reminds students of the consequences of their choices and the responsibility they have to stand up against bias, against the evils of racism and anti-Semitism and hatred. Finally, Holocaust education reminds students that they can be forces for change despite their age. They have resourcefulness, they have youth that enables them to endure even in the midst of negative circumstances. And with their creativity and problem solving skills, they can resist injustice, rise above, and make a change. I believe it is Holocaust education that empowers and inspires students to call for justice and reform. And these lessons are exactly what Mrs. Heller sought to accomplish by writing her memoir, Love in a World of Sorrow. I wish I had had the honor of meeting Mrs. Heller and having my students hear her testimony in person. As I read her memoir, I was struck by her authenticity and bravery to share her harrowing experience as a teenager during the Holocaust. It is unimaginable to me that anyone can endure such tragedy and have the fortitude and will to not only live, but to use that experience to inspire others to persevere in the midst of their own tragedy. That is the essence of Mrs. Heller's legacy. I pray that I am able to live up to that honor in which this award, which was bestowed upon me, that of excellence, and that I am able to honor Mrs. Heller and all Holocaust victims and survivors in doing so. May all of their memories be a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. We applaud your commitment to Holocaust education and we look forward to years of working with you and your students at the museum. Thank you. At this time, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speakers, Fred Turner and his son, Daniel Turner. Fred Turner is a Holocaust survivor and painter living and working in Brooklyn. Fred was born in Vienna and lived in Prague from a young age until 1940. From 1941 until 1945, he was an inmate in numerous concentration camps, among them Terezin, Auschwitz, and Dachau. After the war, he moved to Paris and informally studied art at the academies. Fred eventually settled in New York in 1952, where he continued his work as an artist. 
He has lectured and exhibited his work extensively. His work is included in private and public collections around the world, including in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Smithsonian, the Ghetto Fighters Museum, and Yad Vashem Museum, to name just a few. I'd like to highlight a recently published book by Julia Meyer called Painting Resilience, The Life and Art of Fred Turner, a beautiful book available online. With Mr. Fred Turner is his son, Daniel Turner. Daniel Turner is a Brooklyn-based photographer and filmmaker whose work focuses on family history and inherited trauma, as well as diverse subjects related to public and private boundaries. In 2020, his work on, on his family during the quarantine was presented in a solo exhibition in New York. In, uh, now, Daniel, I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, please help me. Gerton's Graphics? Uh, Gerton's Graphics. Gerton's Graphics, thank you so much. In 2020, his work was shown at LY in Los Angeles to name just two of his many shows. His film work has been screened at venues across the country, including the Echo Park Film Center in Los Angeles, MoMA PS1's film program, and the Austrian Cultural Forum in New York, to name just a few. Daniel has held numerous residencies, and his work has been featured in print and online publications, including the New York Times and Slate. He founded and co-directs 321 Gallery in Brooklyn. We're delighted to welcome you both, Fred and Daniel, to present your work and your thoughts about your own work, the legacy of the Holocaust as it is expressed in your work and the legacy that extends from father to son. I invite you now to begin your presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having me. And um, uh, here we are in uh, my dad's studio in Brooklyn in Clinton Hill, uh, as you can see. And um, you're going to have to forgive us because this is the first time that I can remember doing a dual presentation of our work. So um, we're going to try to keep our life's work short <laughs> and um, digestible and uh, leave some room for questions. And um, I'll, I'll try to guide us along with the presentation. And my dad will, um, you know, uh, interject and uh, offer some, you know, Anything, yeah. Do you have anything you want to say before we begin? No, I'm waiting for you to start. Okay. Um, give me just a second. Um, bear with me. Let's see here. Share screen. And let's go like this, and this, and this. And we'll do this. Oops. Okay. All right. How does that look? Good? Yeah. All right. So um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to start by showing off a few of my dad's earliest sketches um, that he made while he was uh, at in Terezin. Uh, there's only four uh, that, that we know that have survived the war. And if you want to speak a bit briefly about them, dad. Most of my work in Terezin is lost. I gave somebody, when I was shipped to Auschwitz, a box of drawings, and after the war, I expected them all to be lost. In 1982, my wife Rebecca and I went to Israel and to a kibbutz Kivet Chaim Echud and asked them to help me to find my old drawings. And they said, we have a few things but you don't know whom they belong to. And this is one of them. Actually, it's a drawing made in black and white on, with a stick dipped into ink, India ink. And uh, this is a style in which I had all my work done. Now, my, the work that is lost, the whole box, all of it, and I don't know where it is. I assume that some of it survived since four of these survived. And they may be ascribed to somebody else, and that's fine. All I wanted to have is a record of what I was doing then in Terezin, that is daily life, standing in line, 
waiting for food, bunks, triple deck bunks, that is, work that was mostly descriptive what was in front of me. And that was what, is, what survived to me is mostly a reminder that even then I was focusing on what was in front of me. Here, an attempt to make some uh, make some trees. I didn't consider myself an artist then. I just did that as an impulse to do some art. And can you go to the next one? Well, now what we're going to show are the works that you made just after liberation, when you were um, sort of convalescing. Yes, I was asked, now we've seen all these horror films. Now, what did it look like? What did you look like dressed in a uniform? These are picked images that just came back then, done sometime in 1945. I'm not sure is there a date on it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so striped pajamas here, push, pulling a cart under an SS guard. And so a comment on the kitchen uh, in, in the camp. You see those bags in the back, they were actually dug into the ground and covered with trees. And this sort of a comment about the one cook who wouldn't share enough food. So, this was my comment on it. Now, these drawings were made after liberation on April 27, 1945, liberated by the 82nd Airborne Division near Landsberg in Bavaria. And uh, I was hospitalized and a kind soul got me some paper and ink and these were the first things made there and then, that is, drawings. Again, I did not consider myself an artist. I was just recording what was on my mind. On the left, guard towers and, and uh, those triangles on the ground, actually roofs that were covering holes in the ground where we were housed. And you can see the date on this drawing, which is May 26th, which was only a month after you were liberated. Yes. I was still hospitalized then, and for a good while thereafter. On liberation, I weighed uh, 50 kilos, not quite, 75 pounds, more or less. I was one of those shuffling skeleton, life, lice infested, Filthy. It took two baths after liberation to get rid of the surface dirt. I hadn't been washed for months on end. That is, water was a precious ingredient and was not wasted on such a frivolous thing as getting to oneself clean. And so, and I think what is important about showing these drawings is just that. Um, whether they are good or bad drawings is really not the point. It's it's about well, as you can see, they are technically skilled, but this is really my dad's earliest works, which I think it's it's kind of incredible that they are still that they still exist. So, um, moving on, I, I th we'd like to show some of the some of the drawings that my dad made after um, after you left Prague and you moved to Paris briefly. Um, here, here, my dad is. Um, you can see the resemblance there. Um, and um, I just wanted to show some of the drawings that my dad made while he was living in Paris. So you can see these sort of busy street scenes. Um, this is from 1950. And uh, we still, we have this in our possession here in, in New York. The other photos that I was showing you were, were apologize for the quality, but those are in the Ghetto Fighters Museum in uh, Israel. This is a, the first, the only room we had in Paris. And uh, I, I was married to another survivor. And uh, these are some of the pictures. Here she is with me 
and you see me in the background with an easel. These are some of my earliest paintings that I made. And this is along the Seine. Yeah, along the Seine, yes. And, and this is on a boat from, from Genoa to this continent. And a few sketches from uh, once my dad arrived in New York. I was working in a, in a, as a, an expediter in a factory that made war material in 1952. And during lunchtime, I snuck out with a pad, the one you see, and uh, did sketches. These were the quickie sketches of what is today Williamsburg, or parts of Williamsburg, and I always had pleasure drawing mechanical things such as a, as a car and on this. The skyscrapers, the city line was one of the inspirations. Yeah, I, I do think it's important to, um, what, what I find interesting in looking through these old notebooks is um, the attention my dad paid towards the, the skyline. Um, because as you'll see in the next uh, slides of his paintings, the, 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 the skyline as an idea becomes sort of one of the big things that you um, began uh, taking on in your, in your painting. But... Um, yeah. Now, I, by then, I had become a pretty full-time painter. And one of the things that I got stuck in the idea of the execution wall, painted several versions of it. This is the one that remains still in my possession. And uh, that led to other ideas. That is the wall itself, the execution wall, the word wall triggered the wall in Jerusalem. So I made a quickie sketch of it in my imagination. Of course, I didn't know exactly what it looks like. But then that wall led me to the next step, that is the idea, what was behind that wall? And one, the, the imaginary temple became one of the themes that occupied me for many years thereafter, and is in some ways still present to this day, that is the idea of a gate, of an enclosure that is both positive and negative is present at all times. Many of my paintings contain circles, and these circles have a double meaning, that is the circle as a place that protects, a place that does not let the outside in, but also the negative sense, a circle that holds in and does not let me go out. So the conflict of the world that I live with to this day is the world outside and the world inside of me that is trying to break out and to live on the outside, but fully aware of what goes on. These were paintings or drawings and paintings of the imaginary temple. And you notice the gates that is from the execution wall to the wall in Jerusalem, eventually these paintings had the gates in them. That is, what was a wall, suddenly I could walk through. These are just playfulness. You see circles in most of my paintings. That is, in each one of these paintings is, is are circles. These paintings were made with sand. That is, I used sand and pigments and uh, used the surface of the sand to give an idea, to, to have the roughness of it. And unfortunately, slides cannot quite show it. However, the sand came in during the war, that is, while in concentration camp, rather than being able, there was no paper or anything to paint this, but finding a flat surface, I took a handful of sand 
and just spread it loosely on the surface and use the stick, anything sharp, to draw into the into the sand. So even while under rather difficult situations, I still was still had that need to put something down in writing of sorts. Yes, it was just sketches of of a stick in the sand. If I felt that somebody was too close a guard, I just kicked that board or whatever it was, and the drawing would disappear. These were. Oh, should I go yeah. back? Yes, go back. Yeah, these uh, these are some of the impressions of the imaginary temple. It is its usual symbolism of gates of letting in, protecting, that is, it's, it has both ideas of protection and openness in it, that is, the open of gates, you will see other drawings of it. Here you see the, using the symbol of the menorah as a, a theme, and I've used that quite a bit, the menorah with all its meaning of light, of freedom, of uh, liberation. And this is one of the themes that comes again and again. You see the circles in there. That is, in my paintings, you have to start counting. Here you can see the seven branches of the menorah and the two circles, again, with their opposite meanings. One of the themes that I come back to more often came back, and I mean, still in this kind of frame of mind, is the flames. And the menorah here becomes suddenly branches of fire that can go around, but dominated by circles. On the right, these are, now this is one of the typical paintings of the chimney in Auschwitz, well, how I remember it, just a dark shape and flames coming out of it. It's, just, it's an image that is back in me all the time, and that comes out in one painting or another. It's one of my ways of dealing with it. In this particular one, it's, a, it's the opening of a crematorium, obviously never seen one, but the flames form two letters shin or shesh in Hebrew, saying six. So that the six were burning inside. If you count the branches on this painting, you'll find that there are probably 12 of them. That is a 12 times. Below it is the imaginary structure of the temple uh, and again color shape and the feeling define what i was trying to convey now here is a complex it's a rather complex painting made of circles of branches that is those red streaks reaching up in the right lower part that you may see, uh, I'm, I'm not sure the line you show it, all the way in the left uh, is a face. It's actually not a face. It is the image of feathers, bloody feathers, going back to a legend or the literary image of the, of the bedding floating through the village after the village had been run over by the Cossacks and the bedding ripped open. This is the image, one of the images that has come back again and again, and that is a person going into the wires. In, in the camp, one of the way people committed suicide was running into the electrically charged wires. So you see on the left, part of the chimney with six flames coming up. Uh, it was one of those images that come up again and again 
that is somewhere among all these images, there is a memory of what happened. This is just one of them. So here are some uh, photos taken of my dad um, in his apartment in New York, I believe sometime in the 80s uh, the, or the late 70s, just to show you. Um, this is his studio uh, once he moved into Brooklyn, I think before I was born. And this is um, the studio where we're sitting right now. Um, and so I think it's important, of course, to show uh, where your paintings have gone in the last 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the previous batch were made sometime between 1970 and 1985, and these were made uh, in the last 20 years. You may imagine that in all these years, I've painted a few paintings. Most of them are gone, sold, or in collections somewhere. Uh, painting is my life today. Between painting and listening to music is what keeps me going, what keeps me alive spiritually. So this is a feeling that I have or had, and they can, that feeling of sunny exuberance is really a, a counter image to what's going on inside of me. Now here is, is one that does show what does go on in me. That is, these are fields, flames. You may see a chimney on this, the left, in the left half that is, between me, there is that constant conflict between memory of there is another gate. It's one of the themes that come back again and again is memory. And this led me eventually to the museum. And I became one of the speakers of the museum. Before that, I was going from school to school talking about the Shoah as much as I could. And that was had its limits physically. There's just that much I could talk about without getting too upset. This is very much a, a, a way of, of painting these days. I'm not sure how long, how long ago I made these paintings. These are from 2017. All right, so the, the other recent stuff. You may notice in the texture. Texture is a very, very important part of my paintings. That is, a painting that you can touch refers to the, the sense of touch. That touch is very important. Something we are in good friends with, we can touch. We hold hands. A baby lives by touch for a long, long time. So touch is still very much on my mind. In that particular painting that you see is that streak of fire that is going through. It is one of the aspects of my work. And this is a fairly recent one about flames. Fire is still one of the subjects I'll deal with. And just a few examples of seeing the work in scale and in relation to one another. This was a, these are some slides from a recent show uh, in 2017. This was a show we did uh, in 2018. The painting on the far left is uh, called Donald after our uh, soon to be ex-president. And um, now to go to some of my work, um, what I, I don't typically show work that I made when I was, uh, you know, in art school, but I thought for this, for this presentation, it would be kind of interesting to see what, 
I was doing what my sort of early sketches were um, in it, as sort of a you know juxtaposition to my dad's early um, sketches when he was a young artist. <coughs> so what I would do is I would sort of stage these works and have my dad, uh, uh, you know, th all of these are set up. And uh, that's something that I've been doing for many years now, sort of um, posing my dad. My dad is my model. My dad is is my is my muse. So um, and my dad willingly uh, just allowed himself to be put into these situations where I have him pretending to garden, you know, sort of standing around in his bathrobe. <laughs> Uh, playing around with um, slide projections of, of, of documentary footage of, of the camps after liberation. And um, to fast forward from 2005 to uh, 13, I'd like to show uh, two clips uh, from a film I made called My First Wife Stella and my father's first wife, was, uh, her name was Stella and um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just uh, give that a go, hopefully. Nepenta, yes, this is California. What are you looking for? Stella? Yeah. yeah. And that is trip to California, yes. Flew to San Francisco, entered a car there, and eventually drove down to LA. Still I was well then, and therefore I risked the flight to California. There always was a question of what did the war do to her? She was clearly depressed at times. Still spoke about not wanting to live, made half-hearted suicide attempt, and I realized that she was all right when I was around. Did you want to say a few words, Dad? Oh, after no. So the next clip I'm going to show is um, from an earlier, that was just an excerpt, but uh, I just feel that this clip is an important one to show. It's from the film in which my dad is, uh, my dad spoke about uh, going to schools and classes. This is a scene from um, one of those sort of school trips he makes. Sight candle? No. Why not? Why yes? I don't feel that it's necessary. Do you need a candle to remember something? So I I felt it was an important uh, part to show, especially here in these in this context, because um, really I think the question for all of us is uh, what else can we do further to you know, remember and to educate, um, you know, about the about the Holocaust and what can we do that is sort of new and doesn't always recycle the same tropes. And 
Um, I feel that that scene is uh, sort of representative of the kind of the ceremonies that we put on, but then the kind of the private conversations that my dad and I have afterwards, um, because the Holocaust in a way as a sort of uh, industry in a way is, or, or, or the museums and the education, it's something that we, we, we deal with in our work. Um, and so just to finish off here, just some uh, pictures that I, I've been making um, since 2012 about uh, being at home with my parents, um, my father in his studio and that kind of thing. Uh, the work has evolved uh, from more straight, straightforward portraiture. Um, it's gotten more recently, it's become a bit more abstract. Um, and, but I'm not so much showing the, the most recent work here. This is, these are the kind of the earlier beginnings. portions of my dad's body as he gets older, focusing on, on the aging process itself. Uh, playing around at home, uh, sort of, uh, you know, playing around with his perm mask that you made, um, drawing on my mom. This was taken uh, just this year during quarantine. And um, that's the end of uh, that's the end of our of our show. Yeah, in the studio. Right. <laughs>